It is my distinct pleasure today to welcome Dr. Glenn Gabbard, who probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyway. Um, and we're really glad you're all here. Dr. Gabbard is clinical professor of psychiatry at Baylor Uni College of Medicine in Houston, he, and a training and supervising analyst in the Center for Psychoanalytic Studies in Houston. He's also in private practice in Houston. He has authored or edited 28 books, including Psychodynamic Psychiatry and Clinical Practice, the fifth edition. I'm sure you guys have seen that. It is, it is a, a, an iconic text. It's an all-time bestseller at American Psychiatric Publishing. He has also authored or edited Long-Term Psychodynamic Psychotherapy, a basic text, third edition. Gabbard's Treatments of Psychiatric Disorders, Textbook of Psychoanalysis, Love and Hate in the Analytic Setting, Psychiatry and the Cinema, I have that book, it's great. I have some others too, they're great too. And The Psychology of the Sopranos. So he has a big range. His most recent book is Narcissism and Its Discontents, Diagnostic Dilemmas and Treatment Strategies with Narcissistic Patients, co-authored with Dr. Holly Crisp, to my right. He has also published over 350 scientific papers and book chapters, over 350. Previous positions include Brown Foundation Chair of Psychoanalysis and Professor of Psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine from 2001 to 2011, and Director of the Menninger Hospital in Topeka, Kansas from 1989 to 1994. He also served as director of the Topeka Institute for Psychoanalysis from 1996 to 2001. He has received many honors and awards, including the American Psychiatric Association, NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, Vestermark Award for Psychiatric Education, that was in 2010, and the prestigious Mary Sigourney Award in 2000 for Outstanding Contributions to Psychoanalysis. He was joint editor-in-chief, and I am making this brief. He was joint editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis from 2001 to 2007, the first non-British analyst to ever hold that position. And he served as president of the American College of Psychiatrists from 2006 to 2007. Dr. Gabbard's textbooks have been translated into Italian, French, German, Portuguese, Korean, Japanese, Danish, Chinese, Greek, Romanian, and Spanish. He lectures throughout Europe, South America, and Australia, as well as the United States and Canada. The first time I ever saw Dr. Gabbard lecture, he was introduced as being impossible, and I think you can see why. <laughs> it was just, Glenn Gabbard is impossible. How can anyone be everywhere at the same time? Anyway, I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Glenn Gabbard. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, Valerie. And I think the thing about me being impossible was about and hard to work with. I, I think that's what they were talking about. I don't think so. Well, this is a this is a real honor for me to get this uh, teaching award. I, throughout my career, teaching's been very very important to me. Um, you know, the Dalai Lama once said. If you're interested in immortality, teach. Because, you know, my teachers taught me things. I pass them on to my students. They continue to get passed on. And over time, there's a, you know, a kind of immortality of that knowledge that has helped many, many people. And I, uh, <clears throat> I think of all the deceased mentors and teachers that I carry around with me. And uh, in a difficult session, these internalized mentors comfort me, advise me, encourage me, and help me through difficult jams I've had with patients. So, you know, I, I'm never alone in my office in that sense because I have this 
committee of former teachers in in there somewhere helping me through, and that we all need to kind of lean on each other to to get help. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, it's 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 quite a an honor to get this, and I. Um, wanted to start out by mentioning one of my mentors, Ethel Person from Columbia, uh, who co-edited the textbook of psychoanalysis with me. And she once said to me, the reason that she writes is to figure out what she thinks. Now, this sounds very sensible to me. I, I, know, I know that's one of the reasons I write. I'm trying to put things together. and um, So... That's kind of the way I approach this today with the, the notion of the, the difficult patient, which is a broad topic, but I thought I'm going to try to figure out how I think about the difficult patient by writing this. I uh, um, want to start with uh, some simple definitions so we all know what we're talking about. What is a psychoanalyst? For those of you who don't know, it's one who pretends he or she doesn't know everything. <laughs> it's a very important thing you have to master to be an analyst. Now, what do we mean by a difficult patient? That's a, that's a challenging definition here because uh, it's, it's something that is defined very broadly. I can kind of give you my own view of it from my experience. <clears throat> My personal history, as Valerie told you, is I worked with very difficult patients at the Menninger Clinic for many years. And I remember in those days, we're talking about the 70s and 80s, um, difficult to treat patients was even a kind of marketing slogan for Menninger to try to get p patients who'd failed elsewhere to come to the Menninger Clinic. And uh, some of my early publications reflected the difficult patients I worked with on doing nothing in the psychoanalytic treatment of the refractory borderline patient in the International Journal, technical approaches to transference hate in the analysis of borderline patients and also in the International Journal and on hate and love relationships in the quarterly. Um, and these were, these were some of the th things I wrote early on and um, one of the tips I want to pass on to all of you, you know, since this is a kind of a generative process, is the kiss of death in psychoanalysis is being regarded as one who works well with difficult patients. <laughs> you don't want that appellation on you, okay? It's one of my great regrets. Now, um, here's a partial list of characteristics that um, you might call the, the, the criteria that would make a patient difficult. This is a partial list. First is the patient has nothing to say. Now, uh, one of my most memorable patients when I was working at Menninger was a 19 or 20 year old young man who uh, came to the hospital because he was what we would call today a failure to launch. Didn't graduate from high school, not interested in college, not interested in working. And his dad would go into his uh, room in the morning and drag him out of bed. And by the way, we'll call this patient John. He was about six feet four, not, not, no fat on him, all muscle. And uh, his dad had a hard time dragging him out of bed. And have you ever tried to dress someone when they're, you know, dead weight? And, and he couldn't dress him so he, he wouldn't go to work. He wouldn't go to therapy. So since he wouldn't go to outpatient therapy, they sent him to Menninger. And I met him the first day he came in and said, I'm going to be your analyst and I'll see you four times a week. He said, fine, okay, nice. Seemed like a nice guy. So the first day, I left my uh, office, went to the waiting room to get him, and he wasn't there at 9 o'clock. And I thought, well, that's odd. This is his first appointment. So I went next door to the hospital where his room was, and he was in bed. Okay. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this 
sign. But the way you know someone is not really sleeping is when they're lying in bed, their eyelids kind of quiver like this, you know, and their breathing isn't very deep. And so he was lying with quivering eyelids and shallow breathing. And I said, John, okay, it's time to come to treatment, okay? It's 9 o'clock, you're supposed to be in my office. Zero response. I said, okay, well, you are going to have to start because the reason you're here is you didn't go to treatment as an outpatient, so now that you're an inpatient, you have to go to treatment. No response. Then I became completely consumed with doing exactly what the dad did. I wanted to just pull him out of bed and say, come on, we're going. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. He's already unconsciously recreated the major internal object relationship in his life, which is his dad trying to make him do things. And I thought, I just better sit down. So I sat down and waited, no response. So uh, the next day I came and still no response. So for about four weeks, I would sit in his room while his eyelids would twitter and he would fake sleep. Now, nurses would make rounds in the hospital in those days and they'd walk by his room and I'd be sitting in there and they'd look in and they kind of look at me and say, uh, hi, Dr. Gabbard. <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm doing John's treatment right now. <laughs> I, 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 I know I'm not saying anything because he's pretending to be asleep. But uh, I mean, you, you know, I'm, pretty soon he'll, pro he'll probably talk. And, and then it was very embarrassing, of course. And so then uh, I realized that another thing John was doing was making a fool of me, just like he made a fool of his dad. So this went on for four weeks. Now, I had been actively reading Harold Searles at the time, and Harold described a patient who wouldn't talk at Chestnut Lodge, and so Harold would just read the newspaper. So I decided I'd bring in the New York Times and maybe a couple of journals or something. I called one of my consultants just to run this by him, and he said, good grief, if he's not talking, of course you can sit there and read. And then he said, in fact, I'm amazed at how masochistic you are to sit there for four weeks <laughs> with his, him not talking and just waiting for him to say something. So I tried it, and so I brought in, you know, newspapers, journals, got a lot of journals re read, caught, caught up. And I always said at the beginning, I'm here if you need me, if you want to talk, but if you don't want to talk, I get that. So this went by for three more months. So it was a total of four months. And uh, I was starting to have a little bit of self-doubt at this point of what I was doing. <laughs> now, fortunately, on the hospital unit, we had a very smart mental health technician. We'll call him Jerry. He'd been there a while. And one night, uh, see, I haven't mentioned something else. John would get up in the afternoon and horse around with the other young adults. It wasn't like he was depressed. Just he didn't want to be awake when I came in. He was avoiding me. He didn't want to say anything. So anyway, he, he was playing chess with this mental health technician named Jerry. And uh, he said, Dr. Gabbard is treating me like a baby. He just comes in and sits in my room you know, like he's babysitting me. And Jerry says, well, what the hell are you complaining about? If you don't like it, just get up and go to his office, and he won't do it anymore. <laughs> so the next morning, he shows up in the waiting room, and I, I come walking out of my office with my New York Times and three <laughs> journals, and I said, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, it's our time for the appointment. I said, oh, oh yeah, okay, well, well, come on back. And so, you know, he deprived me of reading. I put everything down. From that day on, he came four times a week, and we talked. Never, he never wanted to analyze what was going on in the, that period. But anyway, th this is an extreme case, but it makes a very important point about our helplessness to try to force a patient to do something that they don't want to do. Other characteristics besides that one is the patient who defeats the analyst's effort to help. The patient has no interest in changing anything. That's actually fairly common. The patient cannot collaborate with the analyst in the development of a therapeutic alliance, even though psychotherapy research suggests a therapeutic alliance is the best predictor of outcome. The patient criticizes the analyst relentlessly. That, that's another one that's rather unpleasant for those of you who have experienced that. We'll hear about a, a case at 2 o'clock today where that happens. <laughs> and uh, 
the patient demands rapid results. Now, a friend of mine in San Francisco said that the worst patients now are, are some of the Silicon Valley people who show up and say, all right, I'll tell you, here's my symptom, here's the problem I have, and I need to have it fixed right away. <laughs> then they come back the second week and say, I still have my problem. Why haven't you fixed it? And, you know, this kind of let's do it now type of thing. And this is not that rare. It's not only in the Bay Area. And um, the patient's chronically late or absent. That's another person who deprives themselves of a full hour. And then um, the other thing that, that goes on with many patients is that we get colonized. They, they sort of take us over via projective identification or role responsiveness. One, one thing I want to tell all of you who are candidates is that you see a lot of debates about projective identification versus Sandler's view of role responsiveness versus enactment. The differences are very subtle and probably not worth talking about that much. And uh, I once asked Joe Sandler, um, Joe, your, your role responsiveness sounds a lot like projective identification, and you're an anti-Freudian, and do you want to be associated with the Kleinians in that way? And, he said, well, you know, I've lived next door to Betty Joseph for so long, I finally just <laughs> gave up and relented, you know. He, he was a great guy, by the way. Here's a cartoon. I have half an hour if you want someone to get sucked into your drama. This is a lot of what we do. It's 45 minutes, but we spend, you know, a lot of time getting sucked into people's drama. And, you know, after defining the difficult patient, as I just have, I, I started pondering, what's the other kind of patient? Is there supposed to be one that's easy or not so difficult? Well, I learned from case conferences and supervisors in my early years, there was something called the usual patient. Now, this is largely a mythological archetype. <laughs> but here's what I know about it. Uh, I would be in a case conference presenting one of my difficult patients, and this very senior, very knowledgeable consultant would say, now, um, with your case, you've encountered a lot of difficulty, but with the usual patient, you know, who gets on the couch, free associates, and everything just flows, you wouldn't have this problem. And I thought, boy, I can't wait to get one of those. You know, that sounds really good. Although maybe when I'm older, that's the kind of patient I'll see. You know, and uh, I'm still waiting. I still haven't seen one, but... Um, they're supposedly highly motivated, they come on time, constantly free associate, reflect on associations, discover profound insights, make dramatic changes, and they express gratitude at the time of successful termination. <laughs> so that sounded really good, and that's, that's the usual patient. I thought, fantastic. Now, two major points at this point that I want to make to all of you. The usual patient is actually a difficult patient. You know, it's not like there's a zone of non-difficult, easy patients. And part of my thesis today is the difficult patient may be intersubjectively created. We are usually doing something that makes them more difficult, rather than seeing all of the characteristics of difficulty in the patient, and we can projectively disavow all of them into the patient, because we, we have our role in this. Now, there is something called the easy patient, but it's, don't get too excited because it's not what it sounds like. <coughs> Jerry Fogel, one of my colleagues, wrote a paper in Joppa in 1995 called Free Association as a Defense. And he made the conclusion that the patients who appear easy are usually difficult. And there is a certain kind of patient who tries to be the perfect patient, okay, who will do everything right, and, and Jerry Fogel said they may use the fundamental rule to block out true engagement with the analyst because if the analyst is trying to say something and interact, the patient says, wait a minute, I've got more free associations coming here. And, you know, and they, it's like you know, a fog machine where they, big, big clouds are put out there and, and you can't get inside the person. Now, the other thing that they can do is use very sophisticated capacities for psychological reflection, intellectualized synthesis, to ward off knowledge of more primitive conflict. Now, here, here's the other thing you'll see in the so-called easy patient. They may conceal the emergence of negative transference by complying 
with what they imagine the analyst wants to hear and striving to please the analyst. So they'll be the favorite patient of the analyst. Now, usually the spouse or partner of the patient knows this before the analyst does. The problem with you is that you try to be a lot nicer than you really are. <laughs> Harry Stack Sullivan once said, God save me from a treatment that goes well. There's a lot of wisdom in that. You know, if the treatment is going extremely well, you get kind of suspicious. It reminds me of Anna Freud saying that if you have an adolescent at home who's very compliant, does homework, you know, never argues, never rebels against the parents, you've got trouble. Now, of course, the irony is that Anna Freud never rebelled against her father, and <laughs> I guess she wasn't in that category, but I just thought it was interesting that she was saying that. But so, <laughs> Harry Stack Sullivan saying, beware if somebody is doing everything just right, because you're gonna probably have some difficulty. Let me make some personal observations. One of Freud's most impressive discoveries was that the patient comes for help and then fights off the analyst's effort to help. Resistance and counter-resistance are pervasive. Treatment difficulty is ubiquitous and often co-created. And here's a very important point for this discussion today. A analysts are frequently conveying, maybe unwittingly, that you're not doing analysis correctly to the patient. And I'm sure I've done that often. And the patients labeled difficult are usually patients who do not do what the analyst wants them to do. Now, many of you know about uh, Freud's relationship with the poet H.D., Hilda Doolittle. She came to see Freud in the early Nazi years, 33 to 34. And she was a poet and liked to take notes. So she took notes on lots of her sessions and she would send them to her companion, Breyer, who, uh, Breyer was actually the pen name of the magazine editor, Annie Winifred Ellerman. And she was HD's partner. Now, uh, l let, me, um, let me read to you something from HD's notes. It's a hoot. You know, Freud was clearly disturbed she wouldn't do what he wanted her to do. Okay, so on the first meeting, H.D. comes in, and here's what she writes. I shook all over. He said, I must take off my coat. I said, I'm cold. I do not want to go to bed. The white napkin for the head was the only professional touch. There were dim lights like an opium dive. <laughs> he said he would prefer me to recline. He seemed vaguely shocked that I wouldn't, and he then remarked, I see you are going to be very difficult. <laughs> now, although it is against the rules, I will tell you something. You were disappointed, and you are disappointed in me. Now, later, the most notorious story from the HD analysis by Freud is Freud she was lying on the couch by this time, and Freud was pounding on the head of the couch and said to H.D., the trouble is I'm an old man and you do not think it worth your while to love me. And those kind of stern tones, you know, so clearly there was a little bit of coerciveness going on here to try to get her to behave and say the right things. Of course, he, he overlooked the fact that she has a same-sex partner and that may have been part of it. So the, the demanding analyst is, wish, is, is something that we need to talk a little bit about because we can all be demanding analysts pretty easily. And a after we get colonized and we feel like somebody is inside operating the machinery, um, we can really get drawn into the patient's in internal world and feel taken over. And what happens is we'll, we'll start making demands, uh, subtle or not so subtle, for the patient to conform to the analyst's expectations. This is what we all tend to do, and sometimes to the point where we sound sarcastic, contemptuous, <coughs> coercive, why aren't you doing it? You know, I said to say what comes to your mind, and you're not doing it. 
you know, that's a, that would be a mild version. And, and there are times when a patient's left, and I felt rather ashamed, and I thought, I, I really wasn't acting like myself. I was kind of, you know, going overboard a bit, but we get, there, there is something that happens in, involved with colonization, getting sucked in, projective identification, where we start acting differently. Now, Jessica Benjamin has written some good work on this, and you know, she she's, talks about the doer and the done to, and this is one of the things we fall into fairly easy in analysis with difficult patients. Benjamin cautions that the analytic space is the view of the other as a like subject with an other mind, but it's repeatedly at risk of breakdown into a complementarity of a doer and a done to, a shift from thirdness into two-ness. Now, often this state has a feeling in the analyst that he or she is being victimized by the patient. One of the things that Benjamin writes fairly coercively is this. We are very prone, we analysts, very prone to feel that we're not being treated well by this patient. That patient is awful to me, you know. I don't get no respect, you know. And this kind of thing is very easy to fall into, which can then lead to a kind of uh, a wish to stop whatever it is the patient is doing and get them to behave properly. And here's a, a cartoon of that. He says, don't make me come over there. <laughs> and we, we can all fall, fall into that kind of model. Uh, but, you know, uh, Benjamin talks about recognition theory, where we have to constantly work diligently um, to see who the other person is, to know who the other person is, to try to restore that thirdness, which is where the analytic space is. But the, sometimes it's a difficult path to get there. Now, what I want to spend most of my remaining time on is what can we do to decrease the treatment difficulty? Key points I want to make so far is that psychoanalysis is not coercive. And here's one of the greatest truths in all of human discourse. No one can make anyone else do anything. Now the fundamental rule to say what comes to mind may compromise the patient's privacy. You won't be able to force anyone to do that. And my friend and colleague Tom Ogden in one of his recent books says that what he says to the patient at the beginning of, a, as a, of an analysis is, you are free to say whatever comes to your mind. You're also free to keep things private that you don't feel comfortable talking about. Now, I don't think Tom in, intended for this to be paradoxical, but there's also a, a phenomenon that I've told all of the candidates and residents I've teach for, taught for years. That if you say to a patient, you don't need to talk about that, in about 10 minutes they'll be talking about it. <laughs> but that's, that's just un, an unofficial tip. Now, what we find is that each patient must do analysis the way he or she must do it. This is a very important point that Beyond made repeatedly, that we're going to have to let the patient unfold this treatment and how they have to do it. And one of the things Roy Schaefer said, and he's, he's written beautifully about resistance, he said, by what right does the analyst insist that the analyzan do anything other than what he or she is doing? I mean, just from a simple point of we don't have any control over that, or a right to say, hey, you need to stop doing what you're doing and do what I want you to. So there, there's a kind of permissiveness, and Larry Friedman, one, one of my friends and colleagues who's here today, uh, wrote a very nice paper in the, the Anatomy of Psychotherapy uh, talking about the paradox of accepting and not accepting. He said the analyst must accept the patient on his own terms and at the same time not settle for them. If he does not accept the patient on his own terms, it is as though he's asking him to be someone else. It's a very wise thing to remember because um, there's a sense that the patient 
want you to know who they are, and that may come in the form of being resistant, in fact, usually does, so that we have to constantly handle that, that dialectic of accepting and not accepting. This gets us, of course, to resistance. Please, doc, nothing too aggressive. I'm kind of attached to my symptoms. <laughs> and the patient tells us that in so many ways. And another thing Larry Friedman has uh, said in a wonderful paper in the Psych Psychoanalytic Quarterly in 91, resistance actually reveals more than it conceals. It tells you who the patient is. And that's why I'm always telling supervisees, let the patient resist however they resist. That's the patient's character structure. What we call characterological defenses become resistances in the interpersonal domain of treatment. So you expect to see them, and you'll know all about how this person behaves you know, with other people. And transference is the perfect resistance. It makes clear that the patient's longings for the analyst supersede the wish for understanding. And this is something we have to remember. Another one of my uh, mentors, Sidney Smith, wrote a beautiful paper in the International Journal of the 1970s. It was called The Golden Fantasy. And he says, most patients who come to analysis have a fantasy that they will finally get the unconditional, loving, validating acceptance they always wanted from the analyst. And that that relationship with the analyst will be hallowed in perfection. And that's, as Larry Friedman says, that's, you know, the transference interferes, you know, with the wish for understanding. They much rather be loved than understood, is what Sidney Smith is saying. And Friedman redefined resistance as a preference for non-reflective action rather than the desired state of divided consciousness. Roy Schaefer made great contributions also to resistance. And, and he repeatedly said in his writing, this is not an adversarial, combative view of the analytic relationship when we talk about resistance. He said we should strive for the affirmative approach. And I like that. I use that every day in my practice. The affirmative approach to resistance is what Resisting is for, not what it's against. Why does the patient need to do this? And, you know, instead of viewing it as opposing, the analyst would view resistance as a puzzling or unintelligible behavior that requires understanding and work with the patient to figure that out. When my patient John wouldn't talk for four months, you know, that's serving some purpose. I've got to figure out with him what, what that's about. Schaefer also said, resistance is what makes change slow and difficult. It's always going to be that way. You, you remember the famous Freud quote about resistance accompanies the treatment step by step all the way through the analysis. Much of the resistance, the uncovering resistance, comes from the analyst's counter-resistance. We have our own counter-resistance, certain things we don't want to hear from the patient, too. So we can collude with that. And the analyst, and we've all done this, it's a universal problem, will we'll think too quickly that taking up resistance doesn't get anywhere. You get nowhere with it. But then... At that moment, we're forgetting that not getting anywhere is itself analytic material to explore. It's not like there's something that lies outside the realm of analytic work. The other thing that Schaefer has emphasized, and I think especially in this era of today, when analytic patients are hard to come by, we can all be prone to be benevolent, reparative figures, and try to avoid focusing on the patient's resistance because we want to make sure we keep the patient. We don't want to alienate him too much. And there's a danger in that, too, of, of being sort of a non-participant in the analysis of resistance. Now, 
Um, Leon Greenberg from Argentina uh, wrote a wonderful paper about psychoanalysis as a search for truth about oneself. To me, that makes a lot of sense. It's one of the ways we can define it. Knowing that we are all masters of self-deception. Nobody goes into analysis without having all kinds of self-deception going on. We are ambivalent about searching for the truth about ourselves. We're not wild about it because it's painful. We've, we've spent years building up defenses. Analysts have to respect that ambivalence. And as Phil Bromberg says, we also have to keep in mind there are multiple self-states with multiple truths. It's not like there's one truth with a capital T. So that you'll see different aspects of truth with every patient. And beyond, to make things more complicated, said, oh, the ultimate truth of experience is unknowable. And of course, there is a certain aspect that is unknowable that we'll never quite get to. So we'd have to say most truths are partial. Now, I want to turn to symptoms. This is a major issue in difficult patients. Now, my colleague Tom Ogden and I wrote a book, uh, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me, an article in uh, 2010 that was in JAPA. And we called it The Lure of the Symptom in psychoanalytic treatment. Now, th there's some very important principles here about how we approach symptoms in analysis. The first thing we have to know is patients are deeply attached to their symptoms. One of the biggest risks in terms of the difficult patient and the counter-transference paradigms you get into is the analyst may find himself in the role of someone dragging the patient, screaming and kicking towards a symptomatic cure when the patient doesn't necessarily want to go there. And, and I think pursuing symptom eradication may create a transference, counter-transference configuration that has a moralizing dimension to it. You must give up these symptoms to get healthy. I'll never forget when I was... Uh, a candidate in my institute, Charlie Brenner came to teach us uh, in a, a seminar about um, termination. Now, I drew the unlucky card that I had to present to him, and I was talking about a patient who was kind of in a termination phase, and I'll never forget in his inimitable way with great authority, Brenner said to me, now, if this patient still has symptoms, you better not be thinking about termination. And I sat there, you know, going, well, you know, because this patient wasn't symptom free. And I thought, oh man, this is the end of my analytic career. You know, Brenner is going to dice me to pieces. But he went on to talk about that we should really have analyzed the symptoms and and I was having all kinds of concern about that because of this very thing that I'm mentioning here that Ogden and I talk about, the moralizing dimension of that. I mean, Lacanians would say, the symptoms are part of the self-structure. And if you want to grab somebody's symptoms and take them away, they might feel they're losing a sense of who they are. And paradoxically, the analyst may intensify the patient's resolve to cling to the symptom. So this is a, a very complicated issue. And in, in this article that Ogden and I wrote, what, I want to make several points about it. We say it's not the analyst's role to tell the patient how to live his life or whether or not to desist from behavior that seems self-defeating. Think of the horrible legacy we have as analysts, that not that long ago, a gay person who was in analysis would be told they would have to realize they were actually heterosexual and stop doing the things they were doing. And there were reports of patients complying with that and that some people 
were able to switch sexual orientation. But, I mean, that has been, you know, one of the darkest moments in the history of analysis. So it, what Ogden and I would argue is that autonomy of the patient must be at the core of the work. What, what we do is we try to provide meaning, understanding, and the full range of emotional truth that will help the patient become the principal agent as uh, himself, he's the agent, not us, and decide what he or she wants to do. Here's another point that's very important. Analysis has always been subversive. You know, there's this wonderful story, some say it's apocryphal, but in Freud's one visit to the United States in 1909 at Clark University, he was on an ocean liner with Young, and they pulled into New York Harbor, and uh, Freud said to Jung, little do they know that we're bringing them the plague. <laughs> he, he didn't have much <coughs> patience for the, the rosy optimism of Americans. And uh, Lacan says that Jung told him that story, and that's, that's our, so it's a little bit third-hand or something, but it makes for a good story. Um, but there is something very subversive. You know, it, it, the idea is, you know, that if, with symptom removal, if we, can, if we can say, you know, that removing symptoms is not the primary aim of psychoanalytic treatment, and, and that's not the primary measure of genuine psychological change. That's kind of a radical statement in the era of 12 session CBTs where symptom removal is the whole approach. And we're saying, we actually don't think that. That's not how analysts think. We choose a road that's unpopular, usually shunned, and treacherous at best. But we tend to privilege things like autonomy, self-understanding, as maybe trumping things like symptom removal. Another thing I think that's very common now in contemporary views of what psychoanalysis does would be the dimension of aliveness and deadness. In one of Ogden's books, he says aliveness, deadness, dimension may be the best barometer of how a treatment's going. And there has become a fair, an oft-spoken concern about the deadness of repetitively interpreting familiar patterns of relationship over and over again, and nothing changes. Uh, Dan Brown, in a recent book on attachment disturbance, made the following quote that I wanted to share with you. We disagree with psychoanalytically oriented attachment-based treatments that primarily emphasize the interpretation of reenactments of dysfunctional attachment behaviors in the transference. Such treatments assume that insight about attachment patterns will lead to change in those patterns, but there's little evidence supporting such interpretation-based change. And of course, Winnicott also was a big critic of the overuse of interpretation. And so we're, analysts are too quick to just pounce on an interpretive comment instead of waiting to see what the patient will bring. And so the therapeutic action, I think, has changed in the last, uh, 50 years, we'd say that the interpretation versus relationship debate has waned to a large extent. Most people would say both are important in some ways. And a lot of the current views and contemporary writers about therapeutic action, a good example would be Pharaoh, try to help the patient think in new ways rather than curing symptoms. You know, the goal, then, is the way the patient thinks rather than what the patient thinks. You know, uh, beyond, for example, you know, trying to get the patient to start processing what he would call beta elements in a different way so that we have a way of thinking about our experience. And psychic aliveness and creativity might be more compelling goals today than uncovering buried, hidden truths from the age of three or four, which almost all Hollywood movies portraying psychoanalysis had the, that archeological approach of digging to the, for the repressed memory that will reveal 
everything going on in the person's life. Improvisation also is something I want to emphasize this morning as, as a, a very important development in, in contemporary thinking. Um, Erwin Hoffman's written about it. F Philip Ringstrom has written about it. Tom Ogden and I have written about it. And listen to this quote from Beyond, which I love. The analyst you become is you and you alone. You have to respect the uniqueness of your own personality. That is what you use, not all these interpretations, these theories that you use to combat the feeling that you are not really an analyst and do not know how to become one. Now, uh, one of my uh, recent papers, <clears throat> also co-authored with Ogden, was called On Becoming an Analyst. This came out in the International Journal in 2009. And, and one of the things I want to emphasize with all of you here, many of you whom are candidates, is this. When we finish our training analysis, we are often like the ventriloquist dummy speaking the words of the ventriloquist. We, we're using the analyst's voice in the words that we speak to patients. I remember in my first analysis, my training analysis, when I finished, it hadn't occurred to me consciously, but my, retrospectively, my training analyst finished every session by saying, we have to interrupt now. I, I realized one day, I was saying that to finish every one of my sessions with my patients, not even knowing that I was doing it, you know. And it, it reminded me of something Harold Searles had said to me. He said for 30 years after he finished his analysis, he said he felt that he was propping himself up in his chair in a, in a kind of rigid way like this. And one day he said, why am I propped up like this? Why do I need that? And he said, oh my God, that's how I always saw my training analyst. He seemed propped up. I'm doing what he did. And these examples are, are something about how we internalize the analyst. And we kind of, these ways of speaking are in our bones, so to speak. And my, my message to all of you who are in training and graduating is that as a graduate analyst, you want to strive to find a voice of your own that is not someone else's that you've borrowed. And similarly, analysts who appear to be using a technique they learned can promote a kind of stiffness, deadness, and discourage their patients. I think one of the keys is to be genuine in your voice, in the word selection, and real in that sense. It can make a huge difference. And uh, just from my own personal experience in my second analysis, I had a very emotional uh, session when I was in the role of patient after my mother died. And at one point, my analyst said to me, I can understand why your eyes are filling with tears. Then he said, there was a pause, and he said, that comment was genuine. That was not technique. And it was very moving to me because I could sense that it was genuine and that he was right there with me in the morning of my mother's death. And it stuck with me because it reminded me of how sometimes I fall into talking like somebody doing technique rather than someone who's genuinely connecting with the, with the patient in a, in a voice that's very authentic. And I think that's what we all should be striving for as analysts. And the, another part of this way of improvising and talking is to try to um, bring in an interpretation, not as an oracular statement from Delphi, but rather as a possibility, a hypothesis. You know, it, could it be that the reason you're doing this is because that's how you and your father interacted? Or is it possible that, that it's this or that? So that you say it in a way that the, the patient could feel free to disagree. Say, no, I don't think that's it. And you would say, OK, what other thoughts do you have? You know, rather than saying, this is the definitive truth and I'm handing it down to you. Now, one has to also allow oneself to be carried away by the music of the session 
while remaining in the analytic role. You sit in your chair, the patient's in the couch, but the patient's going to tell you moving stories. You let yourself get absorbed in it, and you'll learn more about who the patient is by going to this territory that he's taking you and his, his story about something that happened to him. And so that, this is important too. And you, you know, one of the most important points I'm making here is that analysis is not an experience that could be mapped out and planned. Events happen between two people and the meaning of those events are discussed and understood. Now, I'm, in my closing comments, I wanna say this. Obviously, some patients are more difficult than others. And some of them are so difficult that they, they really are in the very outer realms of the widening scope. So there is a spectrum of difficulty and you have to be able to adjust your technique. And so those with the psychotic core may have great difficulty symbolizing, for example. Those who dissociate rather than repress can seem less accessible. And obviously, some patients cannot be analyzed in the usual sense. And a core principle of good practice is the analyst must adjust the treatment to the patient, not the patient to the treatment. And here, here's another thing I want to leave you with that I think is um, incredibly important, that we have to remember that fundamentally our duty is to the patient, not to psychoanalysis. So if we need to shift our technique a bit because the patient needs that, that's what we do. We don't say this isn't within the precepts of the psychoanalysis I was taught, so I'm not going there. Let me finish my last comment here. This is another wonderful quote from Bion and how um, we are indebted to the patient to help restructure where we're going and how we need to change what we're doing. Beyond, this is from the Italian lectures, which were transferred into English in 2005. We could say that there is one collaborator we have in analysis on whom we can rely because he behaves as if he really had a mind and because he thought that somebody not himself could help. In short, the most important assistance that a psychoanalyst is likely to get is not from his analyst or supervisor or teacher or the books that he can read but from his patient. The patient and only the patient knows what it feels like to be him or her. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gabbard. Um, can we open it up to sure. questions? Does any, anybody have any questions about any of this? Yes. I have a question about attach the, the detriment of attachment and how it you know, integrates or not integrated in the analytic space. Because you, you mentioned that to look at the test, it's like um, records of attachment patterns could be in some way um, limited. Yeah, it, it is controversial right now. We're, we're in an era where attachment thinking is, uh, there are lots of attempts to integrate it into psychoanalytic thinking. Arietta Slade is one of the leading attachment experts. And her view is that the attachment categories of anxious attachment or dismissive attachment or secure attachment don't, don't fit like hand in glove very well with psychoanalytic constructs. And she says that it's much better to think of the attachment configurations like anxious attachment as dealing with fears and to focus more on the fears than to try to integrate it into theory in a you know seamless way. Uh, because most of the attachment postures have to do with some kind of anxiety that something terrible is going to happen. And that's kind of the way that I, I practice, but I, um, I fully agree with you. It hasn't been integrated well, and I'm certainly not someone who could tell you the best way to do that.
Yes. Go ahead. Next question. Okay. Next. Next question. Anybody? <clears throat> yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I found that the most difficult patient for me was the one that was defensively organized, similar to me, <laughs> and that the supervision was so difficult because. I didn't know what my supervisor was talking about for a long time. <laughs> and then it clicked, you know. Um, but I'm wondering your thoughts about that. Oh, it, it's a very good point because uh, we all have blind spots about our, our own issues. And so that when a patient is like us, there's a huge problem of scotomizing some of the issues because they don't seem pathological to you. They seem like... This is how I am, you know. And so, uh, you know, I always think that, I've, I've said this in much of my writing, we should think of analytic work as taking place in a triad, not a dyad, for that very reason. You know, one of the things I've written about extensively is the problem with boundary violations. And if somebody has something in your it, within your own psyche that is so similar, it's hard to stand outside of that and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't just apply to boundary violations, any kind of similarities. But if you can bring in a third, a consultant, who will see that you're not noticing something in yourself and not noticing something in the patient, that can be tremendously helpful. And uh, I think that going forward in our lives, all of us should think that a consultant is a necessary component of analytic work in an ongoing way. And everybody will say, well, you know, it's hard. They might know who I'm talking about. You can call people in a different city. You don't use names. They have no idea who you're talking about. And so you preserve the confidentiality. But you, you need another set of eyes and ears because of the very thing you point out. We're, we're very prone to uh, have some of the most <laughs> The worst trouble with people like us, because we can't see it because of our many defenses against what the same issues are in us. So thanks for bringing that up. Next. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yes, please. Please come up to the mic, though. There's a mic right over there. Right here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Glenn Gabbard. It's my first time attending the meeting, and it's, I'm glad I, I, I'm here and hear your lecture. And I, I, I think uh, uh, you are trying to say a difficult patient at a difficult time is very common in our work. Don't blame yourself. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I, am, uh, I blame myself very you know, frequently. And um, <laughs> every of my supervisor told me, don't beat yourself up. And <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> and, but you know, there there must be a line between uh, I could improve myself, you know, I could be better, and stop beating myself. You know, how you draw that line? Well, I, I mean, it, experience is tremendously helpful, of course. And even when you have experience, <coughs> you find yourself going in the wrong direction with the patient, making mistakes. Your counter-transference, you know, is, is getting in the way. I mean, we, we are always dealing with imperfection, you know. We don't know fully what we're doing. Some things remain unconscious, but we can, with the help of teachers, consultants, and colleagues, we can get closer to where the patient is and try to work uh, more expertly. But the other thing is we have to be able to say to a patient, I think I might have been on a, ro a wrong track there, you know, and maybe I was emphasizing too much in that area, and, and you're correcting me by saying maybe this other area is more fruitful. This is what Beyond is saying. Allow yourself to kind of be supervised by the patient to some extent. But as, as Larry Friedman also says, you know, you have to also be wary when you do that, that the patient may be 
enacting resistances. And so you have to have a skepticism that you practice with at all times about yourself and about what the patient's doing. And we can't ever turn off that uh, skeptometer. <laughs> we, we have to always be skeptical. No, thank you. Other questions? Other questions, you, and then you can go next. But please use the mic. It's right in front, I think. No, I gave it to her. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you're right. Oh, but I didn't Dr. see it. Dr. Glengaber, do you think you really answered my question? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I, I think that you do have to constantly monitor yourself, and we're all critical on ourselves. But what, what I'm really saying is getting somebody, like a supervisor, a third, to help you see what is what is legitimately a blind spot in you versus what is uh, something that everybody would struggle with, you know, so that you don't beat up on yourself as much. Thank you. Hey, um, so I don't uh, do analysis, but I do like using, you know, a psychodynamic lens. And uh, one of the things you didn't comment on, and I was hoping you could, are highly suicidal patients who sure. kind of hold you hostage with that, you know, refusing to talk about it in the room and then just going out and acting out uh, on, the, on their suicidality. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, we all have to face that situation. And, you know, one of the most important things I can say about working with highly suicidal patients is you cannot prevent someone who is absolutely determined to kill themselves with, with the best treatment in the world. They, will, they can deceive you. They cannot tell you what's going on. Most people who practice a long time will lose a patient or two to suicide because they don't have the accurate information or they make a misjudgment. And I think we often blame ourselves when it's the, the course of the illness is such that no one really could have stopped them. And, and I, um, I think the best we can do is to get all the information we can, use a consultant who's an expert on suicidality if possible, put the patient in the hospital whenever you think it's absolutely necessary, but suicidal patients bring out the limits of what we as therapists or analysts can do. Yes, go ahead. Um, I had the uh, benefit of having a very long analysis starting at the age of 19 with actually a Menninger person um, <clears throat> I came to him as a suicidal patient and also catatonic. And um, he literally, we had 30 years um, of analysis. Uh, the, we had 10 at five times a week, and then probably another seven or eight at four, and then at three. For the rest, um, I became successful at what I was doing and sort of stayed coming because I was getting a lot of benefit in the work, uh, in my own work that I was doing um, outside of analysis. But we never went on the couch. Because, and I asked him, I felt like I was a failed patient, you know, because I never went on the couch. But I, he said, you know, you need eye contact. Um, and, and I felt that he, this thing that you brought up in your, in your uh, talk about being flexible for yes. the patient, um, I, I just, I was moved by that because I realized how flexible he was in his um, understanding of my needs. And uh, I still feel like a failure, but um, 30 years on, in a chair. <laughs> well, um, but thanks for sharing that. Um, I think that the profession has moved in that direction, actually, that there is today more acceptance of using couch versus chair in a way that is based on what works the best for the dyad. You know, Freud didn't like to be stared at all day, and some analysts are like Freud and don't want to be looked at because this the state of consciousness they need to achieve, they can do better of not being stared at. Now, having said that, some analysts feel they get a lot more information from looking at the face of the person and seeing what the nonverbal aspect of it is, other than what free associations are. 
In my own practice, I vary it. Some patients sit up and face me who are in analysis. Others use the couch. And over time, some patients, well, one in particular I can think of wants to use the couch to be able to see me. So my chair is pulled up a little bit. So, you know, there are different arrangements that work better for the person and the analyst. And I think these can be negotiated. I think one of the uh, real improvements in analysis in the last couple of decades is a greater uh, sense that flexibility is probably useful and that rigidity probably is not. Hi. Here. Yes. Uh, David Min. I am a candidate and thus a patient in analysis. And of course, as you're describing the different types of patients and you go over the usual patient, I'm like, yeah, that's me, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, all of us are, yeah. <laughs> so, so my question uh, is, you know, if, if you can talk, say a little bit, uh, if you have any like words of, of wisdom, I guess, for us candidates who are both uh, analysts and analysts at the same time. That's a broad question, <laughs> but yeah, I can say a little bit about it. I, I, I do think from time immemorial, uh, there's been a, a, an awareness that a training analysis has some difference from a non-training analysis. And one of them is that the training analysis is design, has a, as another goal to help you become an, an analyst. Now, there is a, a, a problem built in that even if there's no longer a reporting requirement from the training analyst, you still feel like you're being judged according to your suitability to be a future analyst, which can affect what you say or don't say. So there may be more screening out. And um, when I was going through training, there used to be a standard quip, which was you did one analysis for them and one for you. So that your second analysis after training was one where you didn't worry so much about being judged or what, or what your suitability to be an analyst was, and just you would see somebody outside the system. But, you know, I, I think there's no way to have a training analysis where that isn't somewhere in the back of your mind. And the analyst has to work hard, too. I'm a training analyst, so I have to constantly think this should be like any other analysis but then unconsciously there are forces at work. And so the best you can do is talk about that with your analysts and try to keep analyzing that form of resistance. That's about the best advice, really, I can give you. Thank you. Um, David and then you, or yes. Okay, you and then David. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn, this is beautiful. I want to unpack a little bit, I, I think, for you, what I think you were was imp very implicit in what you were saying, which is when you say you're beating yourself up, there's a punitive aspect to that, which is probably part of what's going on in the treatment and, and that you're bringing some agreement to that in instead of saying, I'm highly imperfect, I'm doing my imperfect best here, and I'm learning, to oh, two plus two isn't five, it's something else without without feeling uh, punished. So I think you were trying to separate that out, that we were all making mistakes constantly. And if you embrace that, it, it's, it's easier to connect learning and disconnect it from, from some um, fantasy of perfection. Thank you, Susan. Hi, I, I was wondering what your thoughts are about the discipline of writing. You've written a lot in the analysts development of their psychoanalytic identity. Um. Well, it, it would be hard to generalize because some of the best analysts never write, uh, and, and some analysts who write may have difficulty doing clinical analysis, you know. So uh, I, I do think, um, like I said at the beginning of, of this talk, that for me, writing helps me understand what I actually think about a topic, where I'm, I'm looking at the literature on the topic, situating myself where I fit in and agreeing or disagreeing with people. So it has, it has value, I think, in shaping 
who you are as an analyst and, and things you might be overemphasizing or underemphasizing, it's like taking stock of yourself. You, the, the publication is very hard these days because um, the issues of maintaining anonymity of the patient is so difficult with the internet and people, you know, Googling everything you write. And that's become a real problem, too, that can really inhibit one from writing. And, of course, there's no perfect solution. If you ask a patient, you know, can you please um, uh, give me permission, there's a power differential where the patient may feel I can't say no but may secretly resent it. Or there can be an exhibitionistic motive of, yes, I want everybody to see all about me, which, you know, there, there are so many problems now in getting permission that analytic writing is really challenged these days. But you can certainly write for yourself as a way of, you know, working with a difficult patient, trying to think out who is this person, what are their defenses, what are their internal object relations, and what are my counter-transferences, and that can be very helpful to write it out for yourself, even if you don't publish. Yes, in in the back, and then you, and that may be all we have time for, I'm okay. thinking. So I don't know your name, but way mm -hmm. in the back, and then you held up your hand. And please come to the mic. I would love to hear your thoughts on a couple of issues related to the concept of avoiding the lure of the symptom cure. Um, one of them is about psychopharmacology, whether we're the prescriber or whether we're referring the patient out because there is an implicit and maybe not so implicit message about decreasing or curing the symptom. And the other one also is for, for those of us who see children and we're consulted on behavioral issues at school while we're seeing the child in therapy. Also, that is the implicit message of, you know, getting rid of the symptoms, so to speak. So I would love to really hear your, how you think about it and how you relate it to the patient. Well, I don't, I'm not a child person, and I would be venturing into territory I don't know anything about with the child part of the question. But certainly with medication and symptoms, um, I find it's an it, it's a incredibly complex uh, interface of, you know, the psychopharmacology and what you're doing as an analyst or therapist. And, you know, the idea that a medication will definitely remove the symptom when analysis isn't working so well to remove the symptom, I think is a, is a big problem because it, some of the medications may mask the symptom or make, make a, for example, a depressive state better there's no question about that. But then you're often looking at issues of the person then more than symptomatic or illness issues. And you see, I think in analysis we're really talking about treating a person, you know, not, not so much a symptom or an illness so that I would, whenever I would suggest medication, I would, I would suggest it with a very modest expectation that it might facilitate a, um, a more open approach to what can happen in therapy or analysis. But I try not to promise something like symptom removal because I think one of the disillusionments with psychiatry right now is the over-promising of what medications can do. And I think we have to be extremely cautious about that. Is that all we have time? We could do one more, maybe. One, one more question. OK. I saw your hand first. <clears throat> I was uh, recently <clears throat> asked to uh, intervene in a conflict between a supervisor and a therapist of longstanding I had known this therapist for 30 years. The supervisors got his buttons pushed. The, the patient was complaining about, I mean, the therapist was complaining about patients being borderline or narcissistic and wanted to get rid of them. Uh, the supervisors say, well, look, you got to deal with that. You can't just send them off to somebody else. 
that he was rather uh, uh, thinking of his uh, patients as like naughty children. Uh, so I tried to intervene, saying, yes, OK, your supervisor got a little nasty. You pushed his buttons. You've got into some enactment here. But still, there's an issue here. I've known you a long time. And you do tend to uh, resent patients who just come in and present their pathology. Uh, you seem to want, to want patients who had good parents so that there will be no negative transference. Uh, you know, uh, he described uh, having a patient that he was seeing that uh, bored him to death. It was like an accusation. I said, so what? You know, most jobs are pretty boring. You ever work in an insurance office? Uh, but uh, this is uh, something that I think is there often not addressed, which is this expectation that patients come to us and we help them. And if they, if, if, if they don't uh, get better, that somehow they're being obstinate uh, children and resent it. Uh, and that that comes through, uh, <clears throat> rather than stepping back and saying, you know, what's going on here? What is, what is my reaction? Tell me about this uh, person's life. Yeah, you know, what what you're saying is is very relevant to the major point I was making in my talk today that we are always prone to get into the doer and and done to uh, paradigm of Benjamin where we really think they should be getting better and working with us to do that. But our narrative and their narrative are quite different. And, and you're right, we have to expect that our narratives are going to be different at times and constantly being adjust, adjusting our, what we do to who this patient is. Ron Britton, the British Kleinian, once said that if you videotaped him through an entire day, you'd see him being very different with each patient because, like Bion says, he's allowing the patient to supervise him. You're going to shift your approach based on what the patient is bringing you. You don't do some kind of generic analysis you know, with every single patient. You've got to be constantly adjusting. So it's a, it's a very important point. Thank you, Dr. Gabbard. In my eagerness to get to Dr. Gabbard's wonderful presentation today, I forgot to mention that this session is the Master Teacher Award session, and Dr. Gabbard is our 2018 recipient of the Master Teacher Award, which is the only candidate-driven award um, that there is in APSA. And it arose a few years ago um, out of the recognition that all of us who make a career in psychoanalysis came to it because somebody inspired us, somebody taught us about psychoanalysis and inspired us to want to do this for our life's work. So um, I think this was just an excellent example of a master teacher today, and we are really thrilled to have awarded it to Dr. Gabbard. <clears throat> 